so um, I spent my thesis working on blood flow modeling, and now I'm too far away. Aha, okay. So um, looking at cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular disease is one of the leading causes of death in the country. Um, in the US alone, every 30 se seconds, someone dies from cardiovascular disease. But what's really concerning about this is that 50% of these instances occur without any prior symptoms or prior warning. So what we're trying to do is give the doctors more predictive power so they can go in early and take preventative action. Let me make sure the sound is off. Um, so we're looking at the coronary arteries um, on the heart. And the, um, <clears throat> the areas that are likely to have uh, rupture and disease develop, um, plaque rupture and disease develop are strongly influenced by the flow dynamics of the blood, along with the constitutive properties and the, um, the particles that you see flowing in the blood itself and the geometry of the blood vessels. So this is very sped up. Typically, it takes years for plaque to develop in the arteries, um, but you're seeing it happen quickly here. And what we're modeling and trying to identify are regions that are likely to have um, plaque develop in the walls and likely to have rupture in the arterial walls. So we're trying to take into account the different factors like patient-specific geometries of the vessels, as well as um, the um, different particles like red blood cells in the fluid flow. Now the doctors we work with at Brigham Women's Hospital have identified the shear stress in the arteries as a quantity that's associated with the places in the arteries where the disease will develop and likely progress. So regions of, um, of the arterial system that are subject to low shear stress are where you're likely going to see the plaque start to build up and form. When you have an artery that's subject to low shear stress, one of three things is going to happen. 60% uh, of the time, your body can handle it, um, can, well, will change, uh, will change, shape, change the shape of the arteries a bit, and um, deal with the shear stress and renormalize it. So you won't have any problems and everything's fine. 20% of the time, you see what was in the video, where you start to build up, and then there's a narrowing of the arteries, and this may lead to a plaque rupture and blockage. And it also restricts the blood flow along the way. Now this is gonna show up in a CT scan or an MRI scan, so the doctors can identify it, they can take action. The one we really care about is um, on the far side here, where you end up having cycles of lower and lower shear stress start to build up and build up, and potentially lead to likely rupture. This will not show up in a CT scan. You won't be able to identify it from t traditional medical imaging techniques. So right now, the only way to assess a patient's shear stress and identify regions like that are um, through simulations like the ones we've been working on. So the way we go about doing this is we get patient data from CT scans, from MRI scans. Uh, you get images like what you see here. And then we're extracting the vessel artery, um, the geometry of the, the arteries. So you get a stack of images. Um, segment the images and identify um, what the geometry is going to be and create the, the mesh that's going to go into the, um, into the C programming. So we then apply for our method, we use a regular Cartesian grid, we apply it over this mesh, identify which are the fluid nodes, inlet loads, outlet nodes, um, and then run our CFD codes. In my PhD, I was working on a Fortran-based code that's called MUFI, and then also Harvey, uh, which is a C-based code I developed. And then at the end of this, we get output like, um, like the ones you see here, where we get shear stress maps and velocity flow profiles. So in our work, instead of using a traditional like Navier-Stokes CFD method, we're, we focus on lattice Boltzmann. We picked it because it can work really well with complex geometries, um, like what you're seeing in the, in the arterial systems. Uh, we can recover Navier-Stokes, and one of the big advantages is everything is data local. So it's all nearest neighbor communication. You don't have any large global Poisson solvers. Um, it's very simple. The algorithm is very simple, where you're viewing the fluid as a bunch of particles that are streaming and colliding and interacting. Um, so it's only, um, it's a very, very simple where you're not using um, external libraries, and we can um, parallelize it extremely well. So we get out... Um, Simu like the results of our simulations are things like this, where we can look at the vor uh, vorticity streamlines, the shear stress mapping, velocity vectors, and really try to analyze the fluid flow and the interactions with the walls and identify regions that are at risk. Uh, so, of course, when we first started, we did a lot of validation against basic um, experimental data, so fluid flow that could be measured in phantom arteries and um, things like that. But what we really cared about is, you know, how do we know that this is right in the body? So we were involved in a uh, CFD competition about a year and a half ago where the, um, they provided patient-specific data. So we got um, the geometry of an eight-year-old girl's aorta, 
And this is looking at the coarctation of the aorta. So what, what, we, what you want to care about here is the narrowing of the aorta and how much the pressure drops across that narrowing. And that's going to determine if they need to go in and um, take surgical action. So for the competition, they provided the, um, the geometry. They measured the pressure above the narrowing and then the pressure below the narrowing, but then only provided um, the upper point. And we all had to calculate the, lower, the pressure at the bottom and um, using our simulation, submit it and try to see um, how close we were to the real, the, the real measured result. They also measured things like the inflow parameters um, and, uh, and like viscosity of the blood and other patient-specific parameters. Um, so our results, um, you can see in the picture here, um, you can see how much, like, how much the pressure is changing across the narrowing there. Uh, we found the mean pressure difference to be 9.2. She'd be at high risk if it was 25, so she was going to be okay and that was fine. Um, and then we ended up having the closest um, to the measured mean pressure drop in the competition, and it was also the fastest simulation in the competition as well. So in, in my PhD, um, a lot of the different pieces I've been working on are optimizing the initial MUFI code, trying to get it so it could scale and we could really do large-scale arterial systems, um, focusing on really developing a new, um, a, a new code that we called Harvey, um, that goes into this, um, optimizing the CFD portion, just focusing on the fluid dynamics part. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we use temporal decomposition to speed up the calculation. And then um, I was getting a physics PhD, so I was also focused on how to add in the deformational forces when the heart's expanding and contracting and how to take into account those extra forces that are being added onto the fluid, but not actually deforming the mesh. So keeping the mesh static, but trying to add in um, extra, the extra deform, uh, deformational forces. So this is extremely computationally demanding. Um, the image you see, or the video you see playing here is only with about 10% hematocrit. In um, real physiological values, you're gonna have four to, like, four to five times as many red blood cells um, in the fluid flow. So when we modeled just the 12 main coronary arteries on the left side of the heart, it took 300 million red blood cells, uh, one billion fluid points, and um, it, when we ran this, it took, um, we scaled it up to about, we could use the 300,000 processors at Ulish in Germany of the IBM Blue Gene P um, to get a full heartbeat running um, for this geometry, and these are the results of the simulation. It took six hours on the full Argon Blue Gene P system just to get one heartbeat simulated, which is about a, um, a million compute hours for one heartbeat, which wasn't really feasible if you want to continue and like, have the doctors be able to use this on a regular basis. So at this point, we decided to focus really on optimizing just the fluid piece and then go back later to add in the cells. Um, the other part, that, the other question that was raised is if you look at how close the red blood cells are, the distance that the, the fluid is moving between the red blood cells, it starts to get extremely, extremely small. So we may end up needing to use higher order methods than what we were initially using with, lattice bolts, like with our initial lattice Boltzmann method to really recover the correct physics. And the initial code that we were using, MUFI, was pretty hard-coded to the method we were using. And we wanted to be able to test out different Lattice Boltzmann models. So that's where we developed this code called Harvey. It's named after William Harvey, who's the first person who discovered that blood actually circulates through the body. Um, it's written in C, and it allows you to test different Lattice models, um, different, um, different methods in Lattice Boltzmann, so we can go a little bit beyond um, the traditional continuum limit. So when you're looking at these higher order models, you have um, more complex lattices. So you end up having more neighbors, you have more equilibrium terms. So you're having a much more complex computational and um, much more impact on the computation and the communication. So we worked um, to really optimize the, the fluid portion of this code. Um, and Jeff Hammond at Argonne actually helped a lot with us to make sure we were getting the best, um, the, the best performance we could on the Blue Gene P and the Blue Gene Q system. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the temporal decomposition that we looked at, just because um, in a lot of the work you guys are doing, I think it's another option for trying to get more scaling, more performance out of your systems that people could think about. So traditionally, when you're doing fluid dynamics, we do the spatial decomposition. We split it up where each processor is handing a different um, region in space. But um, for Lattice Boltzmann, once you hit about 100 fluid points per processor, you start to see a de degradation in your, um, in your speed up, and you're really he hitting the spatial limit. But if you have access to more processors, um, you can start to split it up not just spatially but also in time and have each processor handle a different region, um, a different region for, uh, for us in the cardiac cycle. But I'm just going to give a really high level overview of this, so if you're really interested, just find me later and we can go over details. But um, so we, I base this on the um, parareal algorithm, which is a predictor corrector scheme. So essentially, you run um, a really coarse grain solver. So for us, it was a much uh, coarser grain mesh. 
Um, so you run a coarse grain solver for the entire duration of your time. And this is what's being handled by each processor is, um, in each, uh, each arrow here. So you run that serially. So every processor gets an initial guess of what the fluid is doing at that time point that it's, that, that it's handling. You can then run a refinement in parallel. So you run a much more computationally intensive, much more accurate solver um, on each, um, in parallel on each processor for each time frame. You then run the, um, you run <coughs> the coarse grain solver again and do a corrective step and then um, send this information to the next um, to the next processor in line. So they now have an updated, corrected um, guess at what their initial condition is. And you continue to do this for many iterations until you es essentially get the equivalent of had you just run the, the fine solver in um, serially. So the goal here is to be able to do this in fewer, iter fewer iterations than it would have taken um, to actually run the fine solver itself um, and entirely. And we refer to each iteration as different K levels. So just to give a flavor of the results using this, we can actually recover time-dependent phenomena when using um, parallel and time techniques. So this, um, this is the measured data um, that was given with the original competition I, measured, I mentioned. So this is <clears throat> um, the cardiac cycle as measured in the patient and also the result of um, what you would get with the really fine grain solution if you just ran that. So the initial pass uh, with the first level K iteration, you're kind of recovering the behavior and you're getting fairly close. As we get closer and closer, you can see at, at K equals three iterations, we're getting really um, a lot closer. And then once you're at K equals five, we're getting really similar to where you're, um, what the real result would have been with the fine grain solver. Um, now if you keep in mind where these arrows are, I'll just show you um, from the aorta, uh, uh, the, the different time points for where, these are, where, those, um, where those arrows are. So we're taking the, the cross section here in the aorta and looking at how the error is propagating at those different time points with the different K levels. So you can see that um, it is impacted a little bit by the, um, by the boundary conditions and you see a different change in, near the wall. But as we get closer and closer, you're really removing all of the error and, uh, or a lot, most of the error. And it, um, it depends what level of accuracy you're looking for and where you're looking for the accuracy. For the runs we're doing now, we really care about accuracy at the wall, so that may dictate which um, K level we're using, but if you really care more about the, um, the center of the tube, um, that's gonna change things as well. So looking at um, the, the overall impact of the results, if we were to max out the spatial scaling on 32,000 processors of blue gene P, it took about 1,000, um, like 1,050 uh, seconds to do that run. Using the same number of processors, we can, we can lower the overall runtime, but still maintain an extremely high level of accuracy. So even going to a K level of five, we had under a 1% accuracy. And each number is looking at the, um, the, the, the average error at the wall versus the average error at the center of the tube. So you're seeing the wall at the top and the center at the bottom. So depending which, um, what you're really looking at and you care about. So it's just another method of trying to really make use of the, the, the available processors and lower your overall runtime if what you care about is really getting to your solution as fast as possible. Um, so in, over the course of the PhD, I looked at a lot of different, um, a lot of different blood flow uh, impacts. We looked at the coarctation of the aorta and trying to understand the flow patterns. Um, we worked on atherosclerosis for the bulk of the work and then um, blood flow and aneurysms as well with a group at Stanford and at SUNY. And then in the future, I'm working um, with uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. For, I'm doing a postdoc with Lawrence Livermore National Lab and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and trying to extend this model to start looking at cancer. Um, so it's pretty well known that it's not the primary tumor that's really, um, that causes a lot of the issues with cancer. It's really the secondary and tertiary. So if we can try to help identify where um, the, uh, the um, sites of metastasis are likely to occur, um, then we can start taking some action. And they've shown that it's uh, regions that have high hits, of, like high residence time of the circulating tumor cells, as well as how long um, high residence time and how many times they're hitting there. So if we can start modeling the circulating tumor cells as well as the red blood cells through larger regions of the body, we can try to get a better understanding of where these sites might likely occur. Now to do this, it's going to require doing larger sections of the body than what we have been doing for longer periods of time. And it's not a deterministic um, process, so we'll need to be running many different simulations um, of, of these circulating tumor cells and then trying to understand and applying the statistical model on top to understand where we're likely going to see um, the sites occur. So it's going to require a lot more development on the computational side, the physics side, and um, a lot of compute power to figure this out. Um, 
So the team that I've worked with to put together um, to put together the fluid models over the years has been pretty extensive with a lot of the doctors at Brigham Women's Hospital and Mass General Hospital. We've had to work with visualization experts from Argonne, um, computer science experts um, from UIEC and Argonne, um, and a lot of, from, of help from Livermore and System Time trying to get um, <clears throat> trying to get everything optimized, and as well as the physicists from Italy as um, as well. And then just um, yeah. Well, Thanks to Krell and CSGF for all of the funding. And I definitely would not have been able to do this project without all the funding from CSGF, so I appreciated that.